you, Kenny. Thank you for being here. Yep, yep. Thanks, buddy. All right, go, Mike. Good evening and welcome back to another edition of Beyond the Backstage Pass. I am your host, Vince Edwards. You may know me from Sound Image Productions. And I got a couple closed roadie groups on Facebook, one called The Backstage Pass, another one called Death by Loadout. This evening with me is my dear, wonderful, sweet, good friend and co-host, Kyle Thomas. Kyle Thomas, how are you this evening? Great, Vinny. Great to see you, buddy. Oh, pal. You know, I'm glad you're in the house. Um, good to see you as well. Uh, you know, we're getting <laughs> slammed right now. Uh, great problem to have, you know, I don't think I'm complaining, but man, we're up against it tonight. Huh? Last week, I thought we pushed it right up to the window, but we came on a little late. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, folks out there. Full uh, two minutes late. Yeah, you know, we do what we got to do. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, thank you for your patience. What are you talking about tonight? Um, I just want to thank Chris Leonard, first off, uh, for an amazing show last week. He was an awesome dude. I, I was a little flustered coming from uh, trying to figure out a few other projects right before that, so yeah. I was right up uh, against it. But uh, really nice to stop and, and hear what he had to say. He had a great outlook on it. He do, works a little bit different of an industry than I do and what my focus is. So it's always yeah. really nice to hear his perspectives and things like sure. that. Sure, right. yeah. He's a very disciplined, uh, specific guy. And it was, a, it was a great treat to have him on. We like what he does and his partners do over there at Signal of Noise Podcast. It's a, it's a great show. And um, really behind the whole uh, How We Got Loud thing, that's the history of us and, and audio and live audio and and so I really appreciate what he's doing with that. And so, yeah, we want to thank him for being on. That was wonderful. It was a great appearance, a great show. Yeah, I heard his dad sent you a letter. His dad sent me a note. It was, it was very sweet. I've had uh, over 60 guests on this show, and I uh, haven't got a, uh, uh, you know, a note from a, a father or a parent yet. And it was very sweet. He said that he had watched the show, and he was beaming with pride, I think was his exact words. And oh, that's awesome. So I sent him a note back saying, hey, listen, you know, you, you raised a hell of a kid there, a good father, an incredible professional. And, uh, and uh, he, he attributes all of his love for audio to you and, his, you know, his upbringing with his father. So yeah, it was a good thing. It was nice. Yeah, I don't know the guy super well, but the parts that I do know about Chris that I really respect, just like looking at his online kind of persona and and the uh, signal to noise stuff is like really wanting to to learn like the companies, yeah. like just even talking about like like Schubert Sound or something like sure. that, just how that even formulated is like his interests are 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 very unique and interesting like almost like an archivist or something archivalist a little bit of a historian of the thing i think he likes the idea of getting the education of how this all started where it came from who are the founding fathers the dave shadones of the world the jim gambles and the dirk schuberts these kind of guys the really seminal dudes that had breakthroughs in technology that took the game from you know venues and clubs to stadiums and you know yeah, groundbreaking yeah, stuff. Yeah, really, know, really moved our industry forward. Yeah, and for a lot of us, that's a big deal. I had another thing where um, Toby Francis, a recent guest of ours, was yeah, yeah. on um, Robbie Cope's show. Robbie just made a little show, I guess, anybody with the, with the Zoom and, and, and Curiosity is making shows nowadays. And so more power to him. We support him. And um, he did a shout-out at the beginning of the show, citing with Toby. He was telling Toby, you know, I saw you on uh, Vince's show recently, and... You guys talked about, you know, some of your history and, and your, uh, this is Robbie saying this, uh, your history and um, some of your feelings about family and the business and all, but we didn't get to talk about, uh, you know, the ones and zeros, the process, the gear. The, and so I wanted to speak to that real quick. I think I'm a little asked up about it because it came off a little weird, but I know he meant it good. Um, I don't do that on this show. My show's already thick enough for some of the folks that watch it that don't understand the vernacular and the lingo and the ones and zeros of how, what we do for a living. This is a Johnny Carson remake for rock and roll dudes. We, yeah, I think we, yeah. and it's have, like, other, we're so enveloped. We, we love to talk about that stuff. We're nerds at heart. And I feel like when it comes down to it, we're trying to portray something entirely differently than what most uh, sources online are giving, right? There's a lot of other shows that handle this really well. Yeah. I, 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 wrong end of the snake with Pooch and, uh, and Tater or, or Ribold and Pooch, that show, yeah. or Signal of Noise. 
I feel like this is really well trotted out territory uh, as it relates to talking process and method and theory. As, as it relates to being in the production business. We, we like want to feed stories that these, yeah. that people in our industry generate just through their experiences through it and, yeah. and hopefully inspire or and shed some light on some things that people don't really know about. That's why it's called Beyond the Backstage yeah, Pass. Yeah. A lot of stuff we do backstage <laughs> is kind of a secret. I wear all black because I don't want to be seen. Exactly. Uh, you know, this, this pandemic forced me out of the, the shadows and, you know, I was just reaching out kind of like I do with my groups to, to talk to my friends, to to reach out to some I was worried about. You know, we've, we've had a recent thing where we had a hardship recently as well that we can't really speak about. We're going to just leave it right there and we'll yeah. talk about it maybe. We'll in the say future. today was a tough one. It was a well, tough fucking day. We're here. We're yeah. here together. <laughs> yeah. And the fucking brotherhood is strong and, you know, we united and luckily we have a lot of work we're doing to uh, divert us from hardship and, and woes and deep thoughts. Well, speaking of good friends, man, Charlie Zaricki, I, I just got to go out of the way to, to thank this gentleman for the hammer and the other gifts he sent us. <laughs> I, so Charlie Zaricki, also known as The Hammer, is a godfather to this show. He has been a supporter from the beginning. He sent me this tool knowing that sometimes my crew steps out of line, the knife <laughs> may not be enough, the brass knuckles. The Gave him another me. weapon so for me to run said from. So that I Jesus. need a four-pound sledge to <laughs> sort it out. And I, and I just I trust the man's instincts. You know, he's, he's an old pro. He's fucking been in the game for a long time. We love him, and we really appreciate you. So, you know, directly to the camera, thank you, Charlie. Yeah, you, thank you, brother. You are a dear friend and a sweet man this guy right here is composing a personal letter to you mikey i know reached out the whole crew wants to thank you for, for your continued support and your super big kind heart thank you brother we really appreciate you yeah so um moving on to what i've been doing this week and i guess the past couple months i'm still working uh, with rick allen working out yeah. some rehearsals we're getting it more dialed yeah uh she's she's gotten a pretty big step up in her career so lauren monroe his wife yeah, yeah. we've been trying to to bring the band uh to a good place where we can take it out of the road and really you know set a good impression here there's some dates booked for her isn't there him and her yeah i think uh, what is that? i'm gonna say it wrong i'm sure first date august 26 uh sand city for west end festival that's right uh, we're gonna be headlining so it should, should be fun for the first run i think i will pop in on that and make sure you're getting it right you i just better, be a little, little peeking over your you. shoulder plus you know i love to smack john bearden around as all <laughs> best i can over at right sound so i'm gonna <laughs> Just, uh, just making me being around, I think, makes him nervous, and I like that very much. Good. Well, With, come make him feel uncomfortable. You I'm going to do that. I'm you bring, bring my wife, and my wife will just sit there and giggle in a cackling kind of evil way because she's the fucking best. Oh, by the way, I love you, honey. I hope you had a good class this evening. My, my chick teaches some of her own stuff. She's such a great woman. Yeah, I saw her new little space. I'm proud of her. My chick rules, dude. She just expanded her business, got a new classroom, and she's, you know, got this big fabric thing that she does in yarn and notions, and she's just a go-getter, man. I, <laughs> incredible. Is she still making masks? No, she doesn't really have to. That was, yeah. it's not a, she never had to. My chick don't have to do anything. She does what she wants. She's a, you know, a pretty successful gal. But uh, no, she did it as because she can, because it was a needed thing. She had just opened this business that was not supposed to be, had nothing to do with masks, but she just, her opened her business and the, coincided with the beginning of this crisis right right and so right. she just leaned in and before she knew it she had pushed out a, over a thousand custom masks yeah so for our our audience that doesn't hasn't watched our past shows early on in the pandemic she was making a bunch of masks for us for sound image exclusively it kind of yeah. had a logo on it and stuff yeah. And it really amazing stuff, but I'm happy she's doing good. Those were cool. Those particular, so she didn't make them out of all these beautiful, amazing silks and beautiful fabrics and, you know, multiple layers to make them safe and stuff, but she'd customize them based on the customer. And for us, she sought out actually speaker cover material yeah, yeah, as the badass. exterior cover and then put in the soft cottons in the inside, you know, for the protective barrier. Yeah. But, you know, it was, she's much clever, she's creative and she's a maker. And she's cute as a button, so I mean, <laughs> I'm living, I, I really got, uh, you know, I think there's about seven billion people that wish they had my problems. Yeah, you um, lucked out. Oh, a very lucky guy. Very, very, very lucky. Hey, so this weekend we're going out to uh, Charles Krug under Blue Note Napa, mm -hmm. uh, the concert series that's happening out there, and we're going to be doing a Tony, Tony, Tony show. <laughs> Now, that's going to be a kick in the pants. This band, you know, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of R&B, but I love Dwayne and the, the boys. This, this is a band who was about eight, ten-piece band. You know, oh, the, no, 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 it's a... Twelve? Twelve-piece now, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, when these guys come together, we had them right here in this very spot, and they, they worked their ass. I mean, wow. It was 
I have to admit, it's uh, a lot of people come through here, and I've sat through a few things, and I'm, you know, it's it's my job. But that was fun, and I, I remember having a couple of earworms from a couple of the, you know, this this the uh, this song about raining in California. Yeah, <laughs> I think stuck in my head for like two days. It's all oh, raining in California. We had a blast, man. They're <laughs> such nice it was guys. A thing, yeah. It was so but that'll be a fun show. I think you'll have some fun with that. This yeah, week. Mike's gonna go out and do some some monitors. We got Al and Pettybone going out and doing some lights. Yeah, the P Bone's gonna make that pretty. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. What, what are you doing? I'm doing front of house. Yep. Oh um, man, it's gonna sound pretty. You're gonna oh. do good. They're we'll so see. lucky. They're lucky to have that crew. That's the A1 crew. Sweet. And uh, speaking of the A1 crew, we've been staying busy with uh, just getting built up for this season. Like you were saying, <laughs> it's getting so busy. It's like I, I don't know how to encapsulate <laughs> the paperwork and the, the, the logistics and the gear and the, the oh my God, we've got we've got million dollar weddings, we've got opera, we got ballet, we got R&B shows, we got rock festivals. These are all. It's just raining down, like. Wow, and and you know that's what we do. That's what I'm trained to do. That's what my boys are trained to do is to to figure out how to get out there and and make things happen. So that's what we're doing. But boy, I won't tell you, it's <laughs> you know we're a little rusty. So so um, I feel like the kids are starting to come together, getting their feet under them, and uh, we'll we'll go into July full steam and and just start flinging out shows and and doing what we do and getting some you know getting some push some air around you know. Yeah. power up some big amplifiers and have some fun. It feels good, like, uh, you know, uh, to, to speak on the Loving Hands one hand uh, one year anniversary. It's that, a great page. This page, uh, Loving sweet. Hands for Stage Hands, has been heavily involved with uh, mental health awareness and, and suicidal prevent, suicide prevention stuff through COVID, yeah. specifically with uh, industry professionals in, in the entertainment industry. And... Uh, I think it's like a good balancing act now. You see a lot more people coming back to work, but also trying to figure out that balance of like, okay, how do we do this? We haven't done this for a year. You know, how do we make this doable to, from all this time off to just full horse, you know, yeah, full it, tail boogie The transition is, is, is rough, you know, it's uh, no two ways about it. And that page, you know, I always thought it was a tragically named page, you know. Uh, but, man, the good that it does. You know, John Del Rio brought that out, and my brother George Edwards, and, of course, the one and only rigor extraordinaire Bob Powers put that whole thing together. And it's a bunch of contributing uh, moderators, myself, uh, Sue, uh, Shauna Hall. Yeah, you, you know, all do so, a great job moderating it. It's, you it's know, really we, we just keep an eye and make sure the right people are involved. But it's a, it's a resource for folks. It's a, we're celebrating their year, first year. They came out as a response to some of the hardships we were seeing early on in the in our crews and our uh, people uh, people in our industry mm -hmm. and i think it's been a really good resource for a lot of folks so i'm proud to be associated with it. and a shout out to the the three folks i just named for you know thinking of it and putting getting out there ahead of it it just shows you know we're a brotherhood and a sisterhood and we care about each other and so if you if, you know it's a place that's something you need to reach into and you're you're a member of our industry please reach out to loving hands oh. for strange hands Speaking of uh, some people that uh, brothers and sisters and somebody that I look up to a lot, Nancy Diaz is leaving EAW today after uh, six years of service. Eight, eight, eight. This correction. You know, Nancy Diaz is. I, she's a friggin' stormtrooper. She's a, a she's a badass. She's a, an amazing woman. She, she's a customer support for us. I've got I don't know a million and a half dollars of uh, the sound image gear behind us at EAW's stuff. And amongst a bunch of other gear, this is just one system. This system went through a lot of, uh, because it was a, a, it's a very advanced system, it had to have um, uh, some things dealt with through, the, through its life, you know. And she was right there for us. She was right there uh, so, during some, some tricky stuff that it was incredible. And uh, we had support from EAW directly linked with Joshua and, and uh, Jim Newhouse and, of course, the great Nancy Diaz. So... We just want to send love to her and thank her for all of her amazing support, her continued just being an incredible uh, person. Yeah, I wonderful. can't stress that enough. Thank yeah, you so, so much for your time Yeah, so we wish her much there. luck in what she does in the future and wherever she lands to just know, you know, we're there for her, man. She, there's any, she's, I, I'm not kidding, any time I've had to reach out, and it's been many times, that she's been right there, bam, on it. So anything we can do for Nancy Diaz and any of the people at EAW, we're so into it. So we wish her a lot of luck going forward into the future. Definitely. Sweet, sweet. You well, good, so, Daddy? Yeah, I heard you got an amazing guest for us. Listen, man, you know, we, we were working right up to the end of the, the beginning of the show, hence the reason we were late. Uh, 
you know, like I said, we're we're up against it right now, but we're really lucky to have a, 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 a an amazing cat in it tonight. Let's get right to it. Thank you, brother. I'm glad to have you here. You, yeah. you can take care of the comments and say hi to the people and all that. We'll do. Look at that list. All right, now <laughs> say hi to Jorge Edwards for me. Eduardo, excuse me. Um, this evening, we are really fortunate to have an incredible cat with us tonight. He's an old school roadie for bands like uh, Kiss, Alice Cooper, Stone Temple Pilots, and many more. Uh, he, he made a, a, a weird transition, a cool transition, one that I, I don't think many could do, uh, where he's an author, he's a filmmaker, he's an all around good guy. He's got some amazing stuff we're gonna talk about. He wrote a great book called We Are the Road Crew. I suggest you read it if you can get your hands on it. And a couple other things. The Icelandic Yule Lads. I mean, this is a cat that he uses his imagination, he uses his smarts, and he makes cool things. Let's talk to him this evening. It's the one and only Ken Barr. How are you this evening, Ken? Oh, I'm awesome. How are you? Oh, buddy, you know, I'm living the dream. We're working really hard. We're coming out of this uh, COVID situation with lots and lots of work. And and so, like I said a minute ago, you know, I, I ain't bitching. I'm uh, just stating, and I guess I'm lucky to have those kind of problems. What's new with you, partner? Just thankful things are turning around like we all hoped they would. Yeah, yeah. you know, I always had faith that they would. And it, it, this show was kind of a uh, barometer of that faith, that I knew we'd be back. I knew that, that the people love uh, live entertainment and that there's really no other way to get it. You can't stream that. You can't download that. You can't, you know, go to MTV and get that shit. I don't think you can get any music on MTV anymore. But so oh. I knew the people would want this and uh, we're happy to be back. Hey, listen, man, let me get right to it. How did you get into the business? How did you, how did you get out there and start uh, roadieing for some of these amazing bands I mentioned? Well, it all started <clears throat> when I was a kid working the bars, which I'll always, if anybody ever asked me what's the best way to start, I always say the clubs, you know? I totally if a guitar rig, If a guitar rig's going to go go down, I'd rather be fixing it in front of 10 people <laughs> than 10,000. That's right. You know, Dean DeLeo screaming over your shoulder because his guitars aren't working. Dino but, can be a um, handful, too, so I, I know that. You're not wrong. He likes his stuff um, to work. Yeah, well, they're funny that way. <laughs> Weird, right? <laughs> Go think and figure. That's uh, nutty. Yeah, but um, did you start early with uh, STP, early in their career? Uh, I came out on the Purple Tour. Um, oh, great fucking album. They, they were in rehearsals, and they had... Had their, a buddy of theirs was guitar tech and for Robert and for Dean. Okay. And they had a big stage. This was their step up. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they, it wasn't happening. The changes weren't happening because they had one guy. Yeah. So I actually got places. flown down and the production manager, Dan Stevenson, pulled me into the production office and said, we, you know, we need somebody. This isn't working. So the band came in, we all talked about it. We decided to just run through a show and see how it would work with Eric taking care of Robert, the bass player, and me taking care of Dean. Whole set went smooth as it gets, yeah. and that was the answer. They just they were stepping up, and that was part of the growing pains of stepping up. It was and we we had Eric for the whole tour. We had no no worries, no problems, and that was the fix. Yeah, sometimes it's as simple as that, but you know, it always takes the right people. It sounds like you were the right man for the right job. But their uh, their rise, Stone Temple Pilots. I remember that very clearly. I was doing something with Pearl Jam at the time, and I remember Stone Temple Pilots kind of peaked up, and um, it was uh, it was uh, it was interesting to watch them kind of come out of the shadows and do what they do. It's such a great live band, such an incredible. Uh, you know, for my money, one of the best singers in rock and roll. Said that he oh, passed yeah. the way that he did. Dean, you know, great writer. Uh, and Robert, uh, one of my favorite bass players, just the deep, cool, the shades, and the, you know how he's such an opposite of his brother. It's it's just it's, 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 it's a trip. When those guys were on it, there was nothing you couldn't touch them. There was not a band on yeah. the planet that could. And and when they were having a bad night, yeah. you didn't want to be there. <laughs> I can imagine that is true. Uh, yes, I can imagine that is true. They are special. Uh, they're a special part of rock and roll, and uh, I dig the shit out of them. And they, they're one of those bands that's got an extraordinary catalog. You know, you can go see them oh, today, absolutely. and they're going to do two hours, and you're going to be able to know every single song. And that's that is a yeah. rare accomplishment in rock and roll. You know, so many bands out there with the one or two songs we all know, and you kind of endure the rest of the set list. That is not Stone Temple Pilots. Those guys can really put in, on a show. Back in '95. I was doing Monsters of Rock in South America with Alice Cooper, 
Yeah. Um, it was Megadeth, Ozzy, whatever. Yeah. And you know, 50,000 people in a soccer stadium. I started playing. We're line checking right before Alice's show. And I started playing Vaseline. Yeah, great song. STP had never been there. 50,000 people erupted. It was insane. Yeah, I totally When I that. saw Dean and Robert a couple months later, I told them, I said, you guys could be the next Beatles. You're that good. You just got to keep it together. Yeah, yeah. Well, they had a lot of unique challenges, and not so unique that other bands haven't had those similar challenges. But first of all, there's family involved. Second, there was drugs involved. That's a tricky thing. The creative process was so deep with them. But, you know, one of their main uh, personnel guys was... He was a troubled individual, and uh, I've seen him in many and worked with him in many incarnations. And always, when he was good, man, he was good, you know. And yeah, when you he couldn't wanted, touch him. When he wanted to be naughty, he was real naughty. And that's uh, unfortunately not a, a, an unfamiliar story in our industry. We both have seen this before with a bunch of guys, um, and some of them were, you know. Uh, uh, you know, like the Lincoln Park example, some of that shit was hidden really well. You know, you didn't didn't really know yeah. until it had happened that there was a problem. So, so, but what a what a you know a, a great treat to be able to have worked with them in their prime and when they were you know Purple again was an extraordinary album it was a really a, a seminal rock and roll album. So, what a what a yeah, lucky yeah. that you have that memory and those experiences. I um I did that and then I did the next tour, the Tiny Music tour, which yeah. was again a really good experience. Wow. Yeah, tripping through my paper heart. That's a, there's a really classic songs on that album. Really, just you know, extraordinary. You mentioned Alice Cooper. We, you know, we have a, a kind of a, a thing with Alice here. One of our one of our guys here in the shop is just went out for I think rehearsals with Alice to do his this uh, summer leg of his tour. Uh, the great Greg Price, the, his front of house engineer. And so, yeah, tell us about your time with Alice Cooper. Now, this is let's let's preface this by saying Alice Cooper is there's only one Alice Cooper. He his his between his theatrics his his love of his music, I, I I don't think a lot of people understand Alice Cooper the way we do. He's really two things. There's Alice Cooper on stage, and there's Alice Cooper at the golf course. These are two very different people. What's your what was your experience with the great Alice Cooper? I started in '89 on the Trash Tour. Yeah. Um, Al Petrelli, the guitar player, brought me in. Cool. We had worked together as kids in the bars. Mm -hmm. And I, the thing with Alice is if you did the last tour, you get called, you the first phone call yeah. for the next tour. Um, they are, the Alice Cooper organization are like a family. Yes, that's right. And every, you know, Alice has always got the best people. And, you know, you, you, it's an atmosphere you want to be in because everybody watches each other's back. I did um, all through the 90s up until the Brutal Planet tour, which was set-wise, music-wise, everything was amazing. We recorded that one. That's available on DVD. But great experience. I mean, we played in the Army Stadium in Bulgaria, wow. rain pouring in, just hell on wheels. And Alice did the whole show, didn't cut any songs. I mean, the show must go on, and he does it. He's... Yeah. Trooper At the person. end of, of a two-hour show, he's downstage doing jumping jacks. And, uh, <laughs> uh, There's only how? one Alice Cooper. That's right. There's only one Alice Cooper. Absolutely. I don't but think... his, Go ahead. His, his family are on the tour, his daughter, his wife. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're good people. If you follow them or, or yeah. get involved with them at all, you'll see. They do a lot for the community. They do a lot for troubled kids. They've got three new ministries available kids can go learn guitar or, or drums or whatever or photography anything to support the arts that's part of what they do they give back and they're great i'll give you an example i two years ago had a heart attack they um their manager toby put the word out and they helped pay the bills i mean i paid most of it but they were involved that's you very know? kind yeah, no, they, uh, he's, he's known for, he's legendary for his, his loyalty and his care of his crew. And from what I understand, through this past year of, of tough times, some crew and some band have been helped out. Yeah, yeah. You know, That's you, his way. you gotta, you gotta, go ahead. 
No, you're right. That's his way. That's the way he he does things. He, you know, he's he's extraordinary. I, I, I have uh, we live down in uh, the Carmel Valley area near Pebble Beach, and uh, he comes every year, hell or high water, to the pro am and does this thing for charity oh, yeah. and golfs with Bill Murray and all those cats. And I remember him back as far back when Bing, when it was called the Bing Crosby, and he'd come to it. And it always uh, astonished me how how what a personable, gregarious, sweet guy he is. You know. He, you think of Alice Cooper, I know him from the rock and roll side and he's chopping off his head and doing all the guillotine stuff and all this, you know, his theatrical stuff that he does with his shows. And uh, he's just such a, he's such a, a 180 different guy when it comes to, you know, his, the way he comports himself in the world. He's just a special cat. Well, that's it. The Alice Cooper on stage is that Alice Cooper. When I first started, he didn't even come in the building until the house lights went. And then his security guy, the, the bus would pull up next to the stage door. You, the lights would go down. You'd hear the kids all scream. And he would walk up onto the stage, down to the thrust. Boom, lights up. Alice is on. Yeah. Amazing. And as soon as the show was over, he, he does the meet and greet now. He didn't then. And he would just off, hop on the bus, bus back to the hotel, do whatever he's doing. Yeah. Um, I think he's able to not have to compartmentalize so much because now he stays, he talks to people, you know, and I think that's an awesome thing. You know, people are, are expecting one thing and they're now they're up close and it's like, he's like my dad, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. He has a very parental kind of vibe about him. And he, he has does. For, I you mean, know, decades now. This is a guy that's been doing this for forty-five plus years. I mean, he couldn't be yeah. more of a professional and understand this business than Alice Cooper. I, I, I don't. Like, I don't think there's a person that does. That was our thing. The the cruise thing on on tour on stage. If one of the band members started getting a little uppity or a little out of out of control, you just tell them. I'm not. You know, Alice isn't giving me any nonsense, and if he's not, I'm sure as hell not taking any off of you. <laughs> Exactly. Well said, Ken. I couldn't couldn't agree with you more. Now, you know, well, that was probably Batty's, but uh, yeah. Well, it's funny because I wanted to bring up Batty. You know, so we're talking about Kevin Batty Walsh, uh, Backline Pro, Iron Maiden, all these things. He's been a guest on the show. He's a he's an endless chuckle and an obsessed with catering. Uh, what's your relation with with Batty? How do you know Batty? Uh, the eighty nine ninety crash tour. He was already out there. Yeah. Um, out with Alice. I was in, actually, I missed the first month of that tour because I was in Australia with Debbie Gibson. But then I came in and picked back up. And another example of the Alice Cooper organization, you know, holding on to a job for me when they didn't have to. But Batty was already there. And we just, it was like brothers from day one. It was just like I've known you my whole life and you're my best friend. And He's an awesome guy to tour with. He's an awesome guy. Just, I think he told you the Maui story is breaking his collarbone. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the uh, with the tequila and all the yeah. <laughs> Fucking Batty man. But <laughs> there's something wrong with you if you don't if you can't get along with Batty. I don't think it's Batty. I think that's a that's on you. You know, because he's just oh absolutely. The guy's got a heart to size. Did we of speak beer. on that? Did we speak that we sent him a package? Oh yeah, we forgot to speak on that. So Batty got uh, we. Patty's our brother from, you know, over the pond, you know, and so uh, he expressed a desire to have some of the swag we had, so we sent him a package, and I guess he, he got it yesterday or today. Yesterday. Right? And he you. put a little note up thanking us, and, you know, he's our, he's our uh, uh, Great Britain uh, uh, sound image representative over there. <laughs> so, you know, we, we got mad love for Batty, and um, I can totally understand how you guys are tight that way. It's good, oh, you can tell when, when you see the two of us together, we're like family. Yeah, yeah. No. When uh, I used to do an internet radio show called Road Crew Radio. Yeah. And I'd have Batty on, and he would be five hours ahead in the pub, three o'clock in the morning, and there's Batty waiting for us. He was awesome. <laughs> that makes perfect sense, yes. And he was perfectly happy to do it. He was awesome. 
Yeah. You know, he is awesome. He's singular that way, uh, you know, and he's he's a loyal friend and he's supportive and, you know, he supports this show. And like I said, he's been on and we just we got strong feelings for him and we really appreciate his experience, his vast breadth of experience, his kindness. You know, he's uh, he's similar to Ian Peacock also over at the pond, you know, just a diehard brother and loyal watch. I'm sure they're both watching right now. Shout out to both you brothers. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> those kind of relationships are priceless. You know, it's it's kind of what keeps uh uh, the tired in this game is the the connections and the things that we we the the friendships we make the brotherhoods and uh, so on and this and batty is right on that list i mean he's just a he's a treat and he's a unique human being and oh he's, he's at the top of the list you he know and, and it shows about you mister is a, if batty's down with you that tells me everything that you know you're you're kind of a, a mensch in your own right my friend because he don't roll with you know people that don't aren't aren't right uh, we mentioned you know, we mentioned Alice Cooper. You know, Alice Cooper is you can't really say Alice Cooper without mentioning Shep Gordon. I mean, it's it's impossible. Shep Gordon is 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 I don't know how to put it. Shep Gordon is is an extraordinary human being. What, what, what was, did, did you did you get to interact with Shep? And uh, can you tell us any stories about Shep? Yeah, yeah. Shep would come out on too. I don't know if you guys know this, but he's a gourmet chef. Yeah. And he would come out, depending on his schedule, and he would cook a big meal for the whole entire touring party, band and crew. He, well, 1990, they decided that when we left Australia, it'd be nice to give us a vacation on Maui where he lives. Yeah. He has a big house with right a big courtyard water. right on the water. Yeah, that's right. Right down the street and, from Sammy. I know exactly where he yep. is. Yeah. And all kind of stuff, you know, it was like open house. Yeah. And every night there was something else. One night there was a luau. Another day he chartered an 80-foot sailboat. Just everything, he's part of that whole family mentality. And I think he and Alice just, because they're both are the same way, that's probably why they work together so well. Yeah. I think they're together like 40 some odd years without a contract. It's just handshakes. I wasn't aware of the contract part, but I knew that they've been together for decades. Absolutely. I remember there was one day Alice comes walking up on stage for sound check and he's showing off the, the Rolex Shepard bought him <laughs> because it was their anniversary, like their 40th or whatever. Wow. And that was cool. Yeah. But Shep, um, if he came out, he'd say hello. Um, you know, he treated us the way we should be treated. There was no snobbery or anything. Yeah. He was part of the family. And, you know, I enjoyed my time with him, and I certainly enjoyed his cooking. <laughs> You're a foodie, buddy. You enjoy the good cooking? Uh, Shep, the, I mean, some of the stuff he would make. There was another person, uh, Joe Gannon, who was part of the, uh, the uh, organization from early on. And his wife was another uh, gourmet chef. Um, and they'd come out. And the first thing they want to do, they send somebody out to buy pots and pans so they can do this gorgeous meal. Oh, wow. and, it, and it's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, an Alice Cooper comic book that was released, regular size, regular comic, before all the other stuff. And it's, it's kind of got like uh, the rehab uh, hospital scene on the front. And there's the mad doctor with this big shock of gray hair. And I've heard, and no one will confirm, that that was modeled after uh, Joe Gannon, Papa Joe. Wow. Yeah, that's very cool. But it's a comic book you can pick up cheap, and it was in the late 70s. Yes, yeah, so I seem to but, remember that. Um, yeah, Joe Gannon, in his own right, legendary. You know, Shep, certainly legendary. Uh, oh, absolutely. Have you read his book? I haven't had the opportunity. No, good book, good read. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. One of a kind. He really is a unique individual in, in the music business. He is smart. A, oh, man. <laughs> I, yeah. I read the story Sorry, about I him. I, I read the story about him and Sammy putting together Cabo Wabo. That's right. And and it was 10 percent money, 90 percent brilliance on their part. Yeah. Because they yeah. brought it all in for next to nothing. Yeah. And and when they turned that thing around, it was what, 12 million. I mean, they turned that into a minor empire for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Sammy, to his own, you know, Sammy Hagar, to his, to his credit, 
uh, having worked for him quite a bit. Um, he is a business, he is, him and Shep put together, Jesus Christ, unstoppable. I mean, really, yeah. between the two of them, they, they really savvy, really understand business well. Sammy, uh, you know, he, he came by the Cabo Wabo thing very naturally, you know, he loves a good tequila. And, uh, you know, just a consummate performer, you get Shep behind that, and they're both really savvy when it comes to, uh, to making good deals. Um, I remember um, uh, when I was out with Sammy, every, regardless of the, the laminates and the, 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 uh, the silkies we'd get, they always said, we work for Sammy. <laughs> he was always very, uh, very mindful to take possession of the things that were his. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's a singular pair, but I do, I'm very aware that um, Shep and Sammy are very close, particularly in their Hawaiian connection and their Mexican connection. And uh, yeah. it made a lot of you know, beautiful things happen. Oh, they absolutely have. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, uh, you 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 deep you dig back deep into the the rock and roll history. You know, it's it's why t folks like you are very interesting to me. I'm a man of a certain age, and I wasn't around in the sense of a working person to be able to be around in the early part of a band like Kiss, for example. Which you know, the Kiss Army, they were such a, a monumental band. You know. Uh, they, the early days of their their stuff was extraordinary. Can you tell us any uh, uh, fond memories you had out touring with Kiss? I know you had a part of your tour was in there, the part when they were kind of in the club tour, still having Rush open up for them and shit. You know, these bands were still coming up through the works. No, I wasn't. I came into Kiss with Eric Singer in '92. Oh no, kidding. Eric and Eric and I had been touring together on uh, Alice Cooper. I was a good guitar tech, but he knew me and he could see my work every night because I was always fixing his drum roadies mistakes because I used to drum tech. Um, but there, there's a there's a couple things that really stick. I had a night with Eric where it was like one cymbal break after another. I can't keep up and I'm climbing around like a monkey on the drums while he's trying to play. Yeah. And after the show, um, I pack up his drums. I used to have an oxygen tank for him so he could breathe when the pyro got bad. Yeah. And I had to return it to the ambulance people every night. I was in the middle of doing that, and Gene came walking by, and he just looked at me, and he said, you're always good, aren't you? <laughs> and I said, Gene, I had a rough night tonight. He goes, yeah, I know, but you handled it. He said, you're always good. And he wandered off. I'm like, the monster just... just Complimented That's me. That's a high compliment from Gene Simmons. That is a high compliment Hell from Gene. Yes. Um, I did the, the, I don't know if you, when you said the club tour, that's what the, was the first shows we did with Eric was a club tour. Was it just getting um, his feet under him? Is, is it, you know? Getting his, well, playing wise, he was okay. I mean, he's, he's cocky. He's like a chihuahua bump, biting at your ankles. He never stops. Yeah. But he, he's got the goods to bring it up, bring it back. I think it was more to create a ruckus because new record, new band member, the sure. Kiss Army can be fickle. Yeah, there was a lot of dissension amongst the Kiss Army, if you want to call it that. A little Pe Peter Chris because Eric, Because Eric had blonde hair. That was a big deal to these kids. <laughs> like, so what? Yeah. And if you look back, yeah, they've all had black hair. But it's like, who cares? But it was a big deal. Well, you know, as a drummer, can considerable skills extraordinary drummer oh absolutely a uh, uh, pleasure to work with too sounds like you hit um, real hard if he's breaking cymbals like that though what was the deal it, it's hard and it's also the way he does it the way he, he calls it cracking the bullwhip mm. and it's the All torque the of what he's doing yep and that's and, and i remember we were getting ready to record the the video all well, the concerts for a live three and i was trying i was out of symbols with the zildjian logo i was shipping them back because we would always ship them back so they could reuse them sure and finally i had to call zildjian, zildjian and say we're shooting in three days if i don't have the symbols your logo is not going to be on them boom next day all the symbols <laughs> so i needed to get them to move man <laughs> yeah. it, it did yeah. there was there was talk of of because i was up on the um drum riser with him during the show because I used to swing the microphone up to his mouth and back away so he could do all of his Eric stuff with his arms. Acrobatics. And it was a, there were some close calls, but there was 
this is in in the, the road crew book this as far as funny stories we were up north and he uh, got a tour of a racetrack i don't know which one but they gave him all kind of swag and one of the things they gave him was fireproof shoes like the drivers wear yeah so he comes to the gig all excited because he normally wears these crea- these karate shoes and uh, he's all excited. He says, I want to wear these tonight. I'm like, okay. So he comes out. They start playing. After the first or second song, he's got a face on him like, what the hell? <laughs> and he's like, he says, my kick, my kick drum beater, the, 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 the kick pedal on the right is, is messing up. Change it. And I would be climbing under him while he was playing. They didn't never stop. Yeah. So I change out the kick drum pedal. I slither out of there. I wait another song, and he starts yapping about the other kick drum. He says, the other one's not right either. Get changed it out. And he, <laughs> I, oh, sure. So I did. And, he's, and then he, he looks at me while he's playing, and he goes, it's the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> the shoes were the culprit. They were tight. They were stiff. Sure. They are brand new fireproof shoes you can imagine they're still so, they're different sure so i had to go running to the dressing room get his regular karate shoes up on stage with him one foot at a time i'm putting these things on i gotta tie the laces everything and now the kid now he's happy and that was it that was the last we ever saw the fireproof shoes yeah yeah well you know it's it's, it's tricky we most of us are uh, i've seen that musicians uh, largely are superstitious and they find something that works and they don't want to steer away from that. So it's kind of a unique story that, <clears throat> you know, you'd hear a drummer, somebody particularly that where his, his wardrobe can't affect his playing would take that risk. But, uh, you know, we all, we all live and learn in those type of moments. Well, that's it. You live and learn. He got to try his fireproof shoes. Not so good. Okay. <laughs> Right on. Well, again, live and learn. Listen, you mentioned uh, We Are the Road Crew, the book. I read it. Hey, you are good with your prose, my friend. This was a good read, a good page turner. What uh, what inspired you to write the book? And, and you know, hats off to you for having such good recall. This is, you know, I think a lot of us that have been in the game for a period of time could really write some stories. If, uh, uh, But, you know, I know I struggle to put it all together until something triggers me. How, how did you do that? Well, I had kept all my itineraries from day one, even club shows. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I put them on the kitchen table in a stack and just worked off of that. And that was my reference. Um, And as far as the the writing of it, everybody that's ever done a show always says, yeah, I'm going to write a book. Yeah, I'm going to write a book. And, you know, a lot of people do. A lot of people don't. But I... um, I had an illness come up that was bad, and I promised myself, I said, if I survive this, I'm going to do that book. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Yeah. And when things got good, things were good, and we went. It took me a year to write because I didn't know how how to to write, what format to use. And it was a learning experience, but it was also a learning experience where I couldn't, I, I didn't want to ask anybody or talk to anybody in case I didn't finish it. I'd just be another one of those guys. Yeah, that's right. So I did it without asking. That's why I'd like to do another one and have a lot of people's input. I think that would be a cool thing. Um, but but that's the, the why of it. Um, it, it turned was out just, really good. You did, it's a hell of an effort. You know, it reads well. It's a, it's, it's a quick read. It's also... Uh, um, there's a rhythm to it. And so, yeah, hats off to you. Where can Thank folks you. find that book? Uh, Amazon's your best bet. Amazon for We Are the Road Crew by Ken Barr. Highly recommended. It. It's a good read. And you're not wrong. Hats off to you because so many of us, you know, I don't know how many times I've said through, on a, and at, at the end of any given decade of doing this for a long time now, um, I say, yeah, man, we could really write a, a good book. And then, like you said, most people just trail off and it never happens. But uh, you, you saw that through all the way to the end, and, 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 you know, hats off to you, man. And one thing I'd like to mention, because I've actually gotten some grief about this from some people. Mm-hmm. I saw Lemmy at a show, and I asked him if he was cool with me using that. I don't, didn't need to ask permission because no. it's, it's titles, you know, you don't have to. But 
he was fine with it. So kill myself. That was important. To cat, me. you know. Yeah, but you did the right thing, man. You did the right thing. You say, I'm going to put this out there. Are you cool with it? That's that was the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, I've always respected Lemmy. He's an incredible cat. It's uh, another tragic loss for our community that he he went away. But man, did he leave a a record of him being here, didn't he? Oh, he did the legacy. Yeah, yeah. He was a special guy. I went to. I think people had been stunned. You know, I've had a few drinks with a man down at his hangout at the Rainbow and uh, been to his apartment a couple times. I think it would blow people's mind if they went into Lemmy's apartment. It would. They would not know how to process that. It, his. He was you know an what? avid collector of, let's say, World War II items. And man, mm -hmm. it was that was some shit. I don't, I don't know even how to explain that. <laughs> If, if you watch the Lemmy documentary, they do the, they started in that apartment. I have not and seen it. And it's this. hilarious. Yeah. Um, I, I bought it in the UK because when I, when it came out, that's where it came out first, mm -hmm. but there's a Lemmy documentary and it, it, it starts off with him and his son on the couch and you can't tell it's a couch yeah. playing video games. And I know the second bedroom had, I know the, the materials you're talking about. Yeah. And knives and whatnot. Sure, it's but a, um, yeah, it's a, it's if an you impressive get the chance, collection. It's and he, oh, he tries to go out of his way to assure you it's not because of any affinity for a certain uh, philosophy. Uh, you know, it's just uh, it's, it was something that fascinated him, and he you know he had the ability to collect some extraordinarily rare objects that were, I mean, no way to not be called at least conversation pieces. You know, it was it yeah. was provoke conversation for sure. And his place was, it was, it was like a, it was like a museum. A, it was like a museum. That is the right word. Kind of like a, a twisted museum a little bit, but, yeah. <laughs> but a museum nonetheless. It, it's, you mentioned this something a minute ago, and I know you've had some recent health battles and you look good, buddy. How are you feeling? Everything good with you? Thank you. Uh, things are good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my throat gets a little raspy. I don't know why I, I, I work out with, um, a rehab place a couple yeah. days a week and breathing through that mask always makes me a little raspy, but, sure. um, um, I had my left knee replaced and it was two and a half months ago. And, um, I'm, they're saying I'm months ahead. Yeah, uh, my recovery has been quick. It's been strong because I rehabbed for four months before I did the surgery. Yeah. Good for you. But I appreciate you asking. It's, um, it's getting there. You know, showing my age, going to have to slow down, but, um, you know, all is well. I'm glad to hear that. I've I've often said, as it's happening to me, that, you know, getting old is not for sissies. So I'm glad to see you doing that. You're on the good foot and that, that you know, that, that you're on the other side of that. And, uh, you know, we're here for you if there's anything we can do. I, I, I very much, you know, we had you booked for a couple earlier shows and your health prevented you from coming on. So I really am appreciative that you're here tonight. Oh, I'm glad to be on. Thank you, brother. Hey, you know, you went out with the Bengals. Now, I, I've, I've interacted with the Bengals, Susan, and the, the group there. It's, uh, you know, they were a very energetic band. How was your experience with the Bengals? Did you enjoy that time with them? They were awesome. Yeah, um, nice girls. Mickey was a metalhead, so we yeah, hit it right. off right away. Yeah. Days off, we'd be, we had cassette tapes back then. We'd be exchanging those. Um. She used to have a, an old vintage Ampeg head. And when there was one song called Watching the Sky. It's a song she wrote with Vinnie Vincent. And we had these risers that were like three steps up. And she would start that song up there. And it was a really heavy riff. Yeah. And I remember she starts playing it. And she looks at me and goes, holy shit. Because <laughs> I, I gave it a little more goose than it needed. Yeah. but. You know, because we both liked it loud, but nobody else did. <laughs> so, yeah, they were good. We um, we played MTV Spring Break, and and the girls hung out. You know, we all had a good time. They're nice people. Oh, yeah. They're um, they're, uh, front of house guy, also production manager Steve Bodding, was married to Debbie the drummer. That's right. Yeah. So everybody always hung out. It, yeah, it was kind it's of a just, family vibe almost up until it started getting a little tension, you know, between the band members. But in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, I I left right before the the summer tour of 89, and that's the tour that they had the tensions, and I don't know what it was about, but it was a good time to make my exit and slide <laughs> back over to the Debbie Gibson crew. 
Well, I mean, what an interesting transition going from Debbie Gibson. Of, I don't know how many people remember Debbie Gibson, but she was kind of a one-off. You know, she played the Mall of America and shit, and she had a moment. And then you went to from Debbie straight to Alice Cooper. <laughs> what the hell? I mean, what a, what a jump! It's <laughs> a kind of a light, you know, light speed jump there. That's yeah, like super fun. You know, they were both tours that they were a good experience. So their styles of music, the the, the road crews are the same. You know. Yeah. Um, they they really. I was I was going from a place I was comfortable to another place I was comfortable. So. It wasn't that hard of a transition. Um, no, it was. It was. It was good. Right. There was a lot of good stuff going on. Listen, I was. I'm super interested in the the, the genesis, the origin of the the really fun and neat uh, and and special book, the Icelandic Yule Lads. I know you wrote it. Ken Barr wrote it, and it was uh, illustrated by Danya Esposito. It's 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 such a departure for you, Ken. It's it's a very unique, fun book. What was what was behind that? Well, first, let me tell you, I made the cover of the Sunday edition of MLB, which is an Icelandic newspaper in Canada. Wow. We made the cover. Um, I was dating a woman who was from Iceland. Mm -hmm. And I think we were about two months out from Christmas. And I wanted to do something really nice for Christmas for her. So I emailed the embassy in D.C. And they sent me back, you know, this five or six page PDF. And the story of the Yule Lads was in there, but you couldn't tell what it was because it was like they ran the Icelandic version through a translator and just left it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I can make this Americanized and uh, and more accessible. So that's what I set out to do. And it's it's funny because... Karen and I didn't even make it till Christmas, but the book did. <laughs> that happens, and yeah. and the illustrations, I couldn't find an illustrator to save my life. And a friend of mine said, "My daughter draws. Can you know you give her a shot?" Daniel was seventeen when she illustrated that book. They're really advanced illustrations. They're fun. They're playful. There's a little bit sinister. There's this is a hell of an effort, Ken. Really. Well, uh, my my goal is to bring the Yule Lads to the U.S. And I think that it could be a big thing, and it may take a few more years. But it, another part of the the story, two years later, after I you know I hadn't seen Karen in two years, mm -hmm. I I get a phone call around midnight, and it was her. She was up with her families in Pennsylvania, and they wanted to meet me, and they wanted me to come up there. So I did. And I've been up there half a dozen times since, and they told me that they're my family. I'm there; oh, they're my funny. Icelandic family. That's very. Um, nice. I hear from Gra uh, from Karen's mom a lot. Gudrun's her name, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a, a another book. It's called The Lost Yule Lads. While I was doing my research for the Icelandic Yule Lads, I found twelve names. And no story, no nothing. And we were the first ones to give them a story, to give them a look, to give them a background. Never been done before in the world. Um, I have a third book that's in the works, and it's the You Lads Are Going to Oz. Because I'm also, I do book signings at the Oz Museum up in uh, Chittenango, New York, where Al Frank Baum is right. uh, from. Yes, sir. So very cool. Yeah, it's definitely different. I'm glad you like it. It's um, it was fun. Yeah, you're you're well, you're you're, you're, an, in, you're an imaginative character. You're imaginative, good, and you're a good writer. You know, I I I, I want to try to get this thing out before an hour runs up, so we're up against it. And I didn't leave a lot of time for another special thing that you do. But if you could uh, help abbreviate this for me and summarize and tell the people where they can find them. You make some cool movies. You, you put together these movies. I assume you write them and you film them. Can you can you shed some light on that for us and my audience? Yeah, I uh, write, uh, direct, produce uh, short films from, and go uh, compete in festivals. Yeah, they're really good. 
you, I have everything is on YouTube. Easiest way to, to see what I do, ken-bar.com. It's got links to Amazon. It's got links to YouTube. Um, I, I definitely would like everybody to see Hobie the Elf out of bondage. It's the story of one of Santa's runaway elves runs away from Santa's uh, slave labor camp. <laughs> That's what it is, more or less. <laughs> so, so ken-bar.com. Ken-bar.com. And they can see your works. They can they have links to Amazon and some of the other things that are available, and they can see your movies. Yep, it's all there, one-stop shopping. Well, I highly recommend that they do it. I've went down that road, and it's it's an adventure, and it's, it's interesting and fun. And we really appreciate you being here this evening. We appreciate that... Uh, you know that you, you've had little things lately, and that you're you're getting into the good side of it. I really, I just wish you the best, pal. And uh, you know, we appreciate you very much. Oh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you for spending an hour with us this evening. I uh, hope you continued success and health. I know you're uh, right now looking for some uh, new adventures, and I hope that comes to fruition real soon. I appreciate it. All right. Don't Bart. be afraid to call me to come back. I I'm, will absolutely do that. Thank you. All right, take care, guys. You as well, partner. Be well. Thank you. Well, that was fun. Ken's an interesting cat. Yeah, what a blessing. Uh, that was a great one. Guy does a lot of, I mean, he's he's a very imaginative guy, you know. If you get into his works and you see his movies and all the different things he's accomplished, uh, he's, a, he's a man of many, I'd call him a triple threat, you know. He's one of the best backline guys in the game. He can write, he makes movies, triple threat. You know, how, how many of us can say we got that under our belt? So yeah, really how a, much? a lot of respect for Ken. And, you know, a shout out to our regulars this evening. We love you all. We appreciate you being here. The Noah, the beard. Noah, you're out doing what you're supposed to. The kids are going to miss you. You know that. But you're, you're Papa and you got to do what you do. So have a good evening. Work hard this evening. He's out doing something, I think, in Maine this evening. I might be wrong about that. But somewhere up in the top of the country. And... Um, we want to send him some love. Scott Cheney, hey, baby. Um, listen, we're trying for Chopper Covage. Our schedule's a little mixed up. Some of the folks that uh, do the show with us um, have been called away. We were booked well into the future, and some of those folks have taken on tours and so on. So it'll be tricky for us to, uh, to, to book our show going forward. We have some stuff in the can. We've got some, I think we've got uh, Greg Rideout coming in on the 15th. The 8th show, the July 8th show, is hopefully going to be Chopper Kovic of Van Halen, Smash Mouth. He's an extraordinary 35, 40 year guy in the business. Stories out the butt. I consider him a brother. Uh, he's a dear friend and a sweet, sweet man. So hopefully we'll have him next week. But you'll know one way or another. Uh, we got clip shows coming up too. Some catching up with some folks like the great Greg Price from Ozzy and uh, Robert Scoville from Death Leopard and Rush. And all these guys are going to come in and share some stories with us. So hang out. Thanks for being here. We know you got a thousand other choices, you know, in this crazy world with all these things out there. So we appreciate you very much. We're going to try to keep doing this every. Every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We hope that you come and join us. Until then, be cool, be good to each other. Good night.